For all those who appreciate the work that we're doing here on Standing for Truth, please hit that subscribe button because we are just getting started. Good All right, morning, looks gentlemen. like we are live, everybody. Uh, welcome to Standing for Truth, where we show everybody just how, how much evidence there is for biblical creation and just how much evidence there is against evolution, an old earth, universal common ancestry. So I want to point out we have a great show for everybody tonight. I'm extremely excited. Uh, before I have our guests introduce the topic though. I'm going to hand it over to them in just one second. Just a quick reminder. We have a ton of shows over the next few weeks for everybody. Uh, kicking off with a debate tomorrow night between Fighting Back and Boy on Hyperionism versus Christianity. Also myself, I had a debate or you could call it a discussion last night on universal common ancestry versus independent origin. So definitely check that out. Uh, but we wanna get right into this show. Uh, we're gonna have a lot of great information for you guys. 
As always, please tag me with your questions. Uh, we are going to have some presentations followed by a Q&A as always. So tag me at Standing for Truth. It's good to see everybody in the audience and brothers, uh, Professor McQueen, Brother George, thanks for being here. George, I know you wanted to introduce this important topic. So the floor is yours, George. If I can share the screen, um, please. Can you see that? Standing? No. Um, I need to click there, don't I? Share. <laughs> that would probably do it. <laughs> how about, how about, how about now? Screen, George, just, yeah, there we go. So whatever you clicked, it worked, brother. Here we uh, go. Okay. I, okay. Uh, the thing that motivated me to actually tackle this topic, and I've been researching this, by the way, for the last 11 years, was a comment left by our favourite atheist, uh, Gutsy Gibbon, a.k.a. Erica. She, she claimed there is not a single geologist, young earth creationist or conventional that thinks the Chickaloob crater isn't that from an asteroid, not one. Well, we're about to show you how wrong you are, Erica. So I'd like to hand it over to Professor McQueen to give us a, a probably a 15 to 20 minute geology lesson on the site. And we'll get the ball rolling after that. Thank you. Thank you, George. I'm, I'm looking forward to this one. Uh, Professor McQueen, you are on mute. Um, and Professor McQueen, I want to thank you again for joining us. Um, here, I'll unmute here? you for you. Okay, yes, thank you're you. you're good. We can hear you, Professor McQueen. Good to see you. Uh, uh, staying for truth and George, uh, good to see you guys. Uh, nice see as you we've too, done before in our discussion, I will uh, begin with a 15-minute introduction to the geology of this part of Mexico and then turn it over to George. Uh, at the 30-minute break, we'll take some questions and answers. And then uh, at the one-hour break, when I come back from that, I want to uh, talk some more about just how wrong our critics are, the number of uh, creation geologists and even uniformitarian geologists that have looked at this issue. Is it an impact? Is it a volcano? Or is it nothing? The research I've done over the years in the uh, Yucatan Peninsula of Mexico uh, makes me call this Chick X. Now, why would I do that? It turns out that the uh, site of this uh, feature, I will call it, is uh, not far from a famous archaeological site, uh, a pyramid, uh, Chicken Itza, um, which rhymes with chicken pizza, which rhymes with chick X. So that's what we'll use here. Uh, let's start our map no noticing uh, Standing for Truth. I hope you can see the north arrow there. Uh, the city of New Orleans is illustrated by the X there on the Caribbean Sea. And then as we go up, there's Florida to the east. And as we fly south or take a cruise south to the Yucatan Peninsula, we have some features there. Uh, standing for truth, can you see a dashed circle and a triangle? Yes. Okay, the dashed circle is the area of this supposed feature be it impact or be it volcano. And do you see a series of four dots below the circle standing for truth? Yes, I can. Okay. Those are called cenotes. So pronounce that after me there, standing for truth. Let's learn some Spanish here. Cenote. 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 And then, see, this is what is called a map view of this, of this area of the uh, Caribbean and the Yucatan Peninsula. 
And then if I go above the black line, I hope you can see standing for truth, a tree and a dark line. You see that? Yes, I do. In all my years as a professor, when I wanted to draw a cross section, I would always draw a tree and a line. So here's a cross section drawn through that circle. We're going to find some significance in the fact that there have been oil wells drilled through this area and allows us to do science the way science should be do, done. And that is we make predictions and then we test those predictions. The predicted iridium layer in these oil wells, are you amazed standing for truth? It wasn't found. This the is predicted iridium the, wasn't found. The, uh, this is supposed to be the top locality <laughs> for uh, an argument that at the end of the Cretaceous, an enormous uh, meteorite, as a matter of fact, a very unique one, which was not a metallic uh, meteorite, but rather uh, what's called a chondrite, uh, impacted in this area. And that impact uh, changed conditions, which led to the extinction of the dinosaurs. And the marker for that is supposed to be a zone of iridium. And that is near these oil wells. Uh, George will have other jokes as our time goes on, but may I tell you, standing for truth, one of the greatest stories I've heard about this peninsula in Michigan, in Mexico, rather, uh, called the uh, Yucatan Peninsula. You ready for it? It's a great story. I'm ready. When the Europeans came to this part of uh, Mexico, they came from Cuba to the east and came over to the Yucatan Peninsula. And when they were spotted at a distance coming to the peninsula, the uh, leaders of the uh, civilization at that time uh, went down to the coast. And uh, when they met the, uh, uh, the Spaniards and the Portuguese and all these guys, uh, they had their map there right before them, uh, standing for truth. They had their translators and they were in armor, and these guys come down, and um, the Europeans say, where are we? And the uh, guys standing on the other side of the line said, Yucatan. And so the Europeans went back, talked some more, got their maps out, tried to show them a map of where they were, and they said, where are we? And the knowledgeable people that live there said, Yucatan. Later on, they discovered that Yucatan means, I don't understand a word you're saying. <laughs> and so these guys actually, <laughs> actually wrote it down on their maps. And even to this day, this is called the Yucatan Peninsula. And it, it, I don't understand a word you're saying. So that's a great story that I, like that. I, like I that. learned on my expedition there. Now, Ms. McQueen has been kind to let me borrow a candle and some of toys from the grandchildren to help better illustrate this. Standing for truth, can you see a red layer uh, of this candle there as I put it uh, near the camera? A red layer, yes. A red layer, that's the wax. And... Imagine the uh, Gulf of Mexico or the Caribbean Sea above that. And then you come down to uh, this part of, of Mexico and you see the wicks in this candle. We will let them be symbolic of oil wells that have been drilled in this area. And here is the amazing thing. The red wax here, that is not the uh, Cretaceous Remember that the old vocabulary that's been used for years is uh, that you've got the, um, if you go back a couple of hundred years, you got the primary rocks, the secondary rocks, primary being from creation, secondary rocks from the time of the great flood, tertiary and quaternary, uh, the third and the fourth parts of, the, of uh, geologic history. 
Well, the boundary between the Cretaceous, which is the upper part of these flood year rocks, and what comes afterwards, uh, in my training, uh, was called the Cretaceous Tertiary Boundary. It's got a new name now, but it's the same idea. And the key in this candle, standing for truth, is that when you go down there and look at this part of Mexico, you do, in you do indeed find uh, unconsolidated uh, sedimentary rocks that are all over the area uh, where that circle meets the actual Yucatan Peninsula. And then in that part, we have this word I've taught you, cenote. And my grandchildren allowed me to borrow an asteroid that's supposed to come in and hit that area. Now, this thing is not the size of Toronto, Canada. This is an enormous asteroid that George will say more about, it, about its diameter and so forth. So this thing hits, boom, and it causes a number of features that can still be seen. And then it causes some other features that can't be seen. Standing for truth, if I move to one side, can you see that I've got a blank whiteboard behind me? Yes. Yeah. That blank whiteboard is symbolic of the fact that there's no data to support this theory. <laughs> but what do you do find there? You see these little cups that I borrowed from my grandchildren? These are cenotes. And we'll hold up all three of them here. Those are the dots on the map. Now, what is a cenote? It's a feature in this part of Mexico that's a very deep vertical well that is found around the margins of a gravity anomaly that has been well documented in this area that I've got drawn with the circle. So those little cups uh, standing for truth, that is um, the, the dots that you see on there. And uh, this is supposedly the impact. Several years ago, I visited, and let me get my finger on the right side of my, on the correct side of my board here, rather. I visited Chicken Itza, this uh, archeological site, which is a story for another time. I visited there and the tour, uh, the cruise ship uh, docked at another archaeological site, which is very near this circle. And so I've actually gotten out and walked. And so when George and I were planning this, I thought back as to what I saw during the two-hour period. And I saw a beach, and I saw sand, and I saw the ordinary uh, unconsolidated sediment that you would associate with uh, this part of the southern uh, Gulf of Mexico. What didn't I see, George? What didn't I see standing for truth? Well, I certainly didn't see an evidence of an impact like the great meteorite crater out in Arizona that I've gone to before. And also, I saw no evidence of an ancient volcano. If there were volcanoes there, you would think I would see some remnant of it. Right. So what did I see? I saw a whole lot of nothing. A whole and lot as of nothing. We go, as we go through this discussion, uh, as George has pointed out, um, he has studied Chick X uh, for many years and has done just a phenomenal job in uh, uh, looking at it. Let me teach one more uh, geology word to you, uh, standing for truth. Can you see this word? It's pronounced astrobleem. 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 This is a geologic word for an ancient impact crater that's found in parts of Canada, America, all over the world. There's some evidence that meteorites did indeed hit the flood year uh, rocks. And we can see evidence that uh, both in cratonic areas, dealing with flood year rocks, and also during uh, the Cretaceous. So that ends my 15-minute introduction. 
Uh, now, since I'm teaching you as a student standing for truth, any questions on that brief overview of the meteorite hitting the ground? No, I, I think that was pretty informative and interactive. Uh, Professor McQueen, I always love the visuals and um, just how informative you are in your, and in, in detailed you are in your explanation. So uh, no, I that's would, fascinating, yeah. I would like to turn it over to George and let him uh, proceed with this. You know, we could go two, four, six hours, six hours worth of the data that George has found. George, take it away. Uh, you're not wrong there, David. I'll, I'll have to actually summarize it uh, if I'm going to keep it to 15 to 20 minutes. But uh, I've, I found it quite funny that uh, Erica actually went as far as to call me anti-geologist. Well, I'll just give you a bit of a rundown. Um, uh, as you know, I'm a retired engineer and uh, a, uni a university friend of mine actually was employed by BHP which is currently known as BHP Billiton, one of the largest mining companies in the world. He was, he was employed in the you know, Western Australian mine, so I find that hilarious. And by the way, I even turned down a job from BHP uh, to work in a Queensland mine, and they offered me the position while I was still studying in my third year. So I'm sorry, but water off a duck's back to me. So... Um, Look, as you, as you know, uh, David, I like to start off with a bit of humour. So um, uh, I'm because... waiting for the joke. Oh, yeah, 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 no worries. So why didn't the volcano have any money? Oh, it blew it at the casino. Close. No, it went bank erupt. Oh, bank erupt. Very <laughs> good. I'll remember that for my grandchildren. What about a, 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 another one here for you? A man phoned to find out whether he could get insurance if the nearby volca volcano erupted. Yes. Their answer was, and they assured him that he would be covered. Ah, he will be covered with <laughs> volcanic ash. How how good. Very oh, good. One last one. I'll leave, the, I'll leave the other one till the end, but one last one. If you ever drop a volcano rock on your foot, You'll crock a tower. Oh, that is such an important volcanic eruption. We'll have to talk about Krakatoa another day. Okay. Look, to, to add what uh, Professor McQueen had said about the volcano in the, uh, and the vicinity of uh, that uh, supposed impact uh, site, I'm going to share a couple of diagrams or uh, pictures for you. So just bear with me while I um, go to the my presentation. Do you see? Do you see all those red triangles there? They're um, volcano sites, okay. And a bit further down, you'll see they they form part of the what's known as the Ring of Fire which uh, circumnavigates uh, effectively the Pacific Ocean. Okay, so keep in mind th uh, those volcano sites, okay? Apparently yes. there, are, there are 12 volcanoes in the Caribbean islands. Uh, so this is where David was talking about, the Chickaloob uh, site. It's um, just, there, as you can see, it's the east coast of... Um, Mexico. So that's that red dot there is supposedly the impact site. And we'll see later on that uh, below below the actual uh, water mark or the ocean, there are some calderas. And we'll talk about calderas later on. Uh, okay, so I'll stop sharing and get back to that. Okay. Did that go all right, uh, SFT? Because this is my first time to do such. Yeah, good. Oh, good stuff. Yeah, very good. And you introduced the new geology term, a caldera, which yep. is an indication of a volcano. Good job, George. Okay. The, fir the first thing uh, I want to show is some similarities uh, from known volcano eruptions. So I'm going to share 
a screen again because I've got a couple of photos I want to show you. Okay, the first the first one you'll see is Mount St. Helens. Just note that lava dome in the middle there. So feel free, David, if you want to add some more information in, into this discussion while I'm talking. Oh, you're you're doing Just, a great job. Where is uh, the lava dome in Mexico? Yeah. So then then we go then we go to uh, Gulf of Mexico. That that there in the middle looks like a lava dome. Then we go then we go to Santorini, and you'll notice something else that looks like a lava dome. And of course, there's uh, Mount St. Helens again. And recently, I was at uh, uh, the Philippines, actually, last year, February last year. These are some photos of the Tal volcano before it actually erupted. You'll see caldera, the calderas there, and another one there. And that's a, another a shot of it from probably from a different angle. This is the photo I took in February last year. You'll notice it's all grey because of the eruption that occurred. Yes. Okay. So, so some some history as uh, David was talking about. Uh, just to give you an idea of um, just what's happening. Just let me scroll down to my notes. Okay. the The idea of an asteroid strike was first proposed to explain a layer enriched with certain minerals e.g. iridium, which uh, David mentioned, which is mostly found in objects from outer space. So the layer was generally at the level of uh, in the fossil record where the dinosaur fo fossils petted out. So you can see now how they tied that, that iridium layer to an asteroid because they thought iridium only came from outer space. But we'll show you that that's not really the case. We, fo we find iridium... Uh, while um, through most volcano eruptions. Is that correct, David? That's correct. So they had this asteroid coming in, and they were assuming that this rare earth, this element called iridium, was a fingerprint, a signature. But they didn't do their geology homework. Remember these words standing for truth. Uh, petrology is the study of rocks. Mineralogy is the study of minerals, and those minerals are made up of predominantly inorganic compounds, uh, silicates, for example. And so the more that the volcanic rocks like George Illustrated in the Philippines and other places have been studied, these what are called trace elements or uh, other uh, 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 other elements like uh, uh, like we've been talking about Stop here sports. in this uh, uh, in this uh, discussion, you know, the key is not whether there's any quartz in these rocks or anything like that. The key is iridium, such a uh, very distinctive uh, uh, element, and one would think that would be a fingerprint for uh, you find extinct dinosaurs, you go above it into above the Cretaceous, and then you don't find any more dinosaurs or you don't find any more uh, iridium. Uh, that's not true on a number of different levels. Right, George? Yes. Well, well, actually, others at the time actually even pointed out that uh, volcanism could explain all of, all those features uh, blamed on an, on an impact. They, they even found the evidence of messy vol volcanism at the same time. Like, they, they proposed that the Deacon Traps, for, for those people that don't know, the Deacon Traps are found in India. They proposed that the this impact site somehow caused uh, the eruptions of other volcanoes on the other side of the planet uh, in India, which is and, a, a, bit, a bit laughable. <laughs> but and, anyway... Remember that we're exploring whether is it an impact, is it a volcano, or yeah. is it really nothing? Now, for those of you that were trained in uh, America, uh, what George is pronouncing in our lingo uh, would be called the Deccan Plateau. Uh, the uh, Deccan 
uh, traps, but uh, his Australian accent makes it sound. I thought that was George there, but that's a dog. Um, the uh, his Australian accent makes it sound true just from the beauty of it, right, George? Sorry, we've just got a visitor, and my dog uh, it was doing what comes natural to the dog, so he was letting us know that we've got someone coming. Uh, yeah, yes, David. Um, the 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 uh, Chickalob crater was actually found later. Uh, it was regarded proof, especially in the public imagination. They actually, the so-called shock, shocked quartz particles, said to be diagnostic of powerful impacts, seem to settle the case, right? But we'll find out later. That's not really the case. Um, that that but, is true. Yeah. Please, that please is note, true. Please note, it was evolutionary researchers themselves that remained sceptical, arguing convincingly that it was unlikely that the Mexican crater was from an impact and also indicating that it was the wrong place in the record. And we'll explain why they said that. Now, Can others we... argued... Others argued that the fossil record overall showed in the long age framework, that is, that dinosaur remains did not suddenly go out of the re record at all because they, they actually found dinosaur fossils below, below that iridium layer. Yes, yes. And uh, as we make the transition now to questions from the audience standing for truth, see what we've got from them. But I want to build on what uh, George is saying here that uh, – you have to understand that uh, many uh, deep time standard evolutionary uh, geologists question whether this is an impact or a volcanic uh, area. Um, and as we're going to see, uh, the ICR geologist Tim Clary back in, in, two, uh, in 2017 uh, wrote a uh, article about this uh, area in Mexico that we'll refer to, and I'm going to write it out so that the audience can find it quickly. Um, George, are you going to add your references as an appendix to this particular session? I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll um, add as many as you like to the comment section later on, but I'll, I'll be making... Um, uh, quite, I'll take quotes from a number of those uh, references so that the people can see exactly what not only geologists but other scientists have said on the issue. Yes. Okay, so David mentioned the size of uh, this meteorite. What, what I've been able to find, they es estimate that the size of the asteroid was uh, approximately 10 kilometres across and it uh, created a crater around 150 to 250 kilometers in diameter. Now, pause for a minute and let's yep. think about that class. We're, we're not talking about the distance across the city of Toronto or across the city of Sydney or the, across the city of New Orleans. We're talking about something that is 100 kilometers. Did I hear that right, George? Oh, no, the, the asteroid was 10 kilometres across. Oh, 10 kilometres. But the, the impact, impact, yeah, the, the impact site was 150 to 250. So that's a big variation, but they obviously estimate that. that that's huge. Uh, when we come back after the one-hour break, I'll tell you the story about a meteorite that uh, impacted uh, within a 10-minute drive of my house here in Louisiana, uh, and I'll tell you the uh, story about that. Um, the, um, um, but that we'll save that, uh, for later. Yeah, so here's what, our first. So, sorry, sorry, uh, David, just mm -hmm. before we go, what, one of the first, one of the first, um, I guess, uh, clues that it may not have been a, a, uh, impact site was the fact that, uh, if, if this impact, if this impact was so great, and I'll give you some more detail later in terms of the number of uh, atomic explosions, etc. But they estimated that there would be a spray of shocked quartz far and wide, which they didn't find, because a, an impact site of this size would have spread huge amounts of particles and other rock matter 
across a large wide area which they can't find so yeah. okay back, back back to you david you can probably answer that okay. question on the screen uh, now notice that well, I, uh, I will say, go ahead well yeah no Stand i was just going to say um i was just going to say we do have a, a ton of great questions already from the audience pertaining to the topic pertaining to uh, the information that has been provided already. And there are a few that I can pop up on screen, which will make it easier, I think, for us to yeah. answer. So, Professor McQueen, yes, the floor is yours. Yeah, this me, is the first question. Let me go from ahead uh, from Mr. Gould here. Um, can you confirm that the Wolf Creek Crater is a meteorite impact? And if I have other comments about the Wolf Creek Crater. Uh, that is a uh, locality that I'm unfamiliar with. So during my five-minute break at the top of the hour, I will go look in my meteorite file and see what I can find out about Wolf Creek. Now, keep in mind that if creation scientists are real scientists, then there are a lot of things we don't know, right? So I this is a locality that I simply don't know about, and I'll look into it in 30 minutes. Let's go to the next uh, question here. So question okay. here from Andrew. Andrew P says, uh, what about the possibility of it being a basement uplift like Dr. Tim Clary uh, thinks? Well, I have a tremendous amount of respect for Tim Clary. Why? Because of this. Let me get the correct chart here. Tim Clary uh is a petroleum geologist, has worked as a petroleum geologist. I have taught petroleum geology 40 years ago in at Virginia State University. And so he, he knows a lot of very recent information about oil wells. And again, here's a cross section through the circle. And Tim Clary has looked at the um, oil wells that have been drilled right off the Yucatan Peninsula and uh, he thinks that from what he sees in that part of the Gulf of Mexico, that uh, that it may be a, a basement uplift. Uh, one thing that uh, Tim Clary's work culminating in his 2017 paper uh, showed clearly was that a lot of the arguments for a meteorite, a lot of the arguments for a volcanic caldera like George has introduced to introduced us to are simply uh, not true um, in his view. And this basement uplift idea uh, is a, a good one. Now, for those of you that might be new to standing for truth and new to this whole flood geology argument, the intro comment that George made is certainly true that when you look at the range of individuals that study flood geology, the accusation or the comment that nobody believes it's not an asteroid, well, that's simply a shallow argument because the asteroid impact idea captures the imagination of Hollywood movies and uh, junior high textbooks. But when you look at it in more detail, it's a far more complicated issue. Okay, I got another question here, and then I want to go back to George to react to some of this uh, stuff. Let me see what it says. Um, ask me if he thinks it's possible that a small asteroid could have struck uh, Chick X and how he thinks layers of iridium, iridium clay sometimes feet thick formed. Well, Andrew, Pre Andrew P., you're going to have to prove that to me because the research that George has done and certainly the research that Tim Clary looked at in these oil wells going uh, through the, let me get to the cross section here, the oil wells piercing through this part of Mexico, uh, as far as I know, uh, did not find a clear uh, iridium layer there. Now, Keep in mind that when you go to different parts of the world at the top of the Cretaceous, uh, uh, there are uh, iridium layers that have been uh, identified and a tremendous amount of uh, uh, 
radioactive uh, radiometric dating has been done on these rocks. George, have you seen this remarkable claim that it's not just Cretaceous, but it's Cretaceous point dot, dot, dot. In other words, to three decimal places, they claim, and then they got an error, an error bar of uh, 0.001 or something. Have you seen that reference? It's unbelievable that they would presume to be able to get a date uh, 65 million years ago that uh, precise, isn't it? Yeah, well, well, that's correct. I mean, I'll, I'll show you later a reference uh, that says that they've even found iridium uh, four meters thick when uh, they claim that the Chickaloop uh, deposited uh, iridium at one centimeter thick. That's a big difference. And I'll, sh I'll show you uh, many other references where they, they even in um, modern volca volcanic eruptions, they've in Hawaii especially, They've shown that uh, iridium um, has actually been expelled into the atmosphere at 17,000 times greater amounts than that found. So uh, all, the, all the evidence that I've seen points to volcanic activity as well as a fl flood activity to deposit these sedimentary layers, which points more to a global flood where we would expect through, through mass tectonic plate movements and mass uh, volcanic eruptions to have produced all these iridium layers that we find across the world. Now, let me uh, tackle Joe's, Joe Wilson's uh, question here about these idea of big bubbles from the flood. We'll defer that to the next hour, but I do want to answer her uh, in this regard. In, in my study in preparation for today, I called the senior ICR uh, scientist, Dr. Gary Parker. Many of you may know that Dr. Parker wrote uh, a very important and best-selling book, um, uh, Creation, the Facts of Life. And Dr. Parker uh, is not only a biologist, not only someone who's a DNA expert, but he also minored in geology as he went through his graduate days. So he's had a long interest. He and I hiked the Grand Canyon together uh, back in the mid-1980s. And so I called him about this very issue. And he said, McQueen, one thing that you should tell the Standing for Truth audience is what about the, what about the angiosperms? What about paleobotany? If this mysterious iridium in the atmosphere and the ocean and so forth was supposed to be somehow responsible for the demise of the dinosaurs, how come How come the angiosperms weren't uh, killed? And I said, well, Dr. Parker, what are you talking about? He said, well, if you look at the traditional paleobotany view of how you get uh, the evolution from gymnosperms like ferns up through angiosperms, you would expect that the this iridium poison would kill them just as well. The climate change would kill them just as well, but they, it did not. And so um, it brings me to one of my uh, lecture points that I've used over the last 40 years. Uh, Dr. Dwayne Gish always used to say, how do you get standing for truth from fish to Gish through an evolutionary? I didn't want to be put to one side. So I said, well, how do you get from Bean to McQueen? How do you get from paleobotany all the way up through uh, the, you think if we have problems identifying the transitional organisms going from amoeba to man, try to find out the lineage going from a fern to an oak tree. It's uh, a nightmare. But let's go back to the uh, rocks here, George. What's your next point about the chemistry? Uh, I think you should expand a bit on this uh, well, volcanic idea. Actually, oh, actually oh, George, oh, actually, yep. George, maybe we'll end with this one. And then um, the other questions we have, um, I had a couple questions from the critics come in over, over my Facebook page. We're going to save those for the second hour, but maybe we'll end with this one. Cause I think this is um, 
a comment, kind of a question to you, George, based on what you were saying about the dinosaurs and where they're found. Lucas saying that the problem is to find one above, but to find one below is okay. What are your thoughts? If, if you wanted to just clarify, George, on what you were saying earlier, go ahead, brother. Oh, well, sorry. Um, I might have said that incorrectly. They, they do find a dinosaurs above the iridium layer. That's what I so, said. Yeah. Uh, I thought you might want that, to clarify. That's that's the the uh, that's why they were skeptical about uh, about it being an asteroid strike. So now, there's a okay. there's another okay. angle to what George just said, and um, that angle is this: um, as a young Earth creationist, as someone who believes that two of every creature that breathed air was on board the ark. I certainly believe that there were every kind of dinosaur uh, on board the ark, uh, including maybe pterodactyls. I, I don't know, but this part of Mexico that I went down to study. So there is the uh, Chick X crater or volcano or whatever we're going to call it. And then do you see to the west of it, I have the triangle and that triangle stands for the Chicken Itza archaeological site. Now, how in the world would an archaeological site tie into a discussion of when we might find something like a pterodactyl? Well, the uh, culture that built the Chicken Itza pyramid, whole story for another time, but that culture um, drew pictures of a creature that they called Quetzalcoatlus. And when you visit this archaeological site in, uh, in Mexico, um, uh, you, uh, your guide will take you in front of the, the uh, pyramid and he'll do this. He'll say, all 20 of you clap three times. That sound reverberates against the acoustic architecture of this remarkable pyramid. And after you do that, yeah, 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 you hear this echo. And so the, uh, the gods there, they look at the culture uh, from this period of time. Oh, that's the sound of Kisa Kodalus. Oh, that's the sound of what we would in interpret to uh, be a pterodactyl. So from a creationist standpoint, clearly there were uh, dinosaurs that got off the ark and bred and moved about the, the earth. Uh, and so every culture has got a dragon legend that probably ties back to this, but on point about our crater here, not only do we have problems with the geochemistry and the geology of where you steered the crater there? But if you go over to the Chicken Itza pyramid, for heaven's sakes, you might have had a pterodactyl-like creature flying over this crater long after it was created. So that's a little something extra in French Cajun culture. That is called a lanyap, if you have ever heard that word. A little something extra, a land yap. Uh, uh, standing, are you there? He may not be there, but I. Uh, okay. Oh, I'm here, uh, George. If you wanted to go into your. Uh, yeah, I was going to share the screen and show show some of these references. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, there we go, and. Click that share, George, and we will be good. Okay, so since we're going into um, some more information pertaining to this topic, guys, just make sure you're tagging me with your questions. Great questions so far. And you're good to go, George. Okay. Uh, Carl Wieland wrote a, an article called uh, Dino Impact Theory. Um, back in 2004, he references... Uh, a new scientist um, article called Four Days That Shook the World. That's the, 
that's the reference there. But uh, without saying too much about that article, you can read it yourself. But I, I want to concentrate on the point that Eric had said that 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 no geologist thinks that it was that it was not a uh, asteroid uh, strike. So I found this reference by Charles Officer and Page. They actually wrote wrote a book called The Great Dinosaur Extinction Controversy back in 1996. Now, note, note uh, Charles Office, Officer, uh, his education, right? He's a PhD from Columbia University. He's a geologist. Erica, he's a geologist at Dartmouth College, Hanover, and a professor in Earth Department and research professor at Thayer School of Engineering. This is what they, they concluded. The, the authors strongly oppose the impact theory of the death of the dinosaurs. They are both scientifically and soci sociologically and present evidence from a variety of fields to support the catastrophic volcanism theory. I'll just reduce that uh, zoom there. Okay, did the iridium layer come from outer space? No, it is Earth produced. Was the uh, layer that was laid down near instantaneously? No, they say it was laid over thousands of years, likely from the Deccan traps. Now, the famous geologist Art Meyerhoff, I don't know him, David, maybe you do, but working on the Pemex drill cores show yeah. that the crater was volcanic. C.W. Hunt has also shown that many believed impact craters are really volcanic. So please note, th these, these are prominent people who also have differences of opinion about it being an asteroid strike. I will show you more references later on where a German geologist, underlined and bold a geologist, went through a core uh, drilled uh, holes at the um, at the site. These are the oil uh, core holes, and he he actually pointed out that it was actually a volcanic eruption due to uh, um, a built up of high pressure under under the uh, the surface. Now, John Woodmoropi, John knows him well. This, this, I'd like to quote this um, fr from him. There are now over thirty. Iridium horizons in the Ferrozoic record. These can be explained by a slowdown in sedimentation rate as iridium rained from the sky, whether from a terrestrial or an extraterrestrial source. They pose no problem for the flood at all. Now, so for now inter may I interject here? Yep, yep. Uh, John Wood Morapi is a longtime friend of mine, 40 years now. Uh, that's his pen name. His real name is Jan Petschkes, and a tremendous researcher back in the period of time of the 80s and the 90s. Uh, and so um, John Wood Morapi, um, or Jan Petschkes, um, is a very careful researcher, and that would be worthwhile to get his book. Back to you, George. Yeah, well, uh, I just wanted to point out that he, he does have a, an MA in geology and a BA in bio biology from uh, Midwestern U.S. state. You know, so these these people aren't just uh, run-of-the-mill geologists or or uh, people just commenting on uh, what they might have read somewhere else. <clears throat> so remember what uh, Erica said about no one, including young Earth uh, creation geologists, don't deny the. Chickalubs is an asteroid impact. Well, I've already shown you not only young Earth creationists, but also uh, secular secular um, geologists and scientists. Uh, here's another one. We spoke about Tim Cleary. He, Tim Cleary is a PhD. He's a research associate at the Institute of Creation Research, and he earned his PhD in geology. Okay. This is what Dr. Cleary had to say. I mean, he's got a lot, a lot of, I've read his report and it's fantastic. Somebody should read it. I think there's a reference to it below this. So I'll get to it. But this is what uh, Dr. Cleary said. Although some of the expected criteria for identifying a meteorite impact are present at the Chillab site, such as high pressure and deformed minerals, not enough of these materials have been found to justify a large impact. 
there's a reference there one and even these minerals can be caused by other circumstances including rapid crystallization and volcanic activity okay, okay. Well, standing for truth uh, go ahead and give the screen back to me i have a reference to uh, uh an article that i want to put on the screen hold up to my screen this is the article that uh, george is talking about uh dr tim clary in 2017 wrote a uh, an article on this uh, mexican site you can go, and I wrote that wrong. I'm sorry. It should be icr.org, uh, volume 46, number six. It's an essay that you could find very quickly that would contain the information that George has been talking about. Let me correct that website. It's not .com. It's .org. Uh, and in five minutes, I'm going to take my break and go check my meteorite file for this Wolf Creek thing. Now, why do I want to spend my break doing that? I want to do that to illustrate to the Standing for Truth audience that the best geologist, as I've been taught for 50 years, is the one that's seen the most rocks. And so I simply don't know anything about Wolf Creek, but I assure you in 10 minutes I will. So... I will be ready to go on that. You think that's a point well made, George, that we don't know every answer? Oh, no, no one no one makes that claim. We, we, we certainly don't do, uh, but I'll, I'll be showing you how there's a, a lot of skepticism there, not only from geologists, but from paleontologists and other scientists that yeah, but question that it was an impact site. Well, don't miss my point, George. What I'm trying to say is that many of the critics of a young earth, many uh, of the critics of flood geology do portray us as theological know-it-alls. Know uh, they portray us as people that don't follow the scientific method or don't know the difference between a dictionary and a thesaurus. Um, everybody knows that a dinosaur that knows a lot of words is a thesaurus. You get it, George? Yes, that's a good one. David. <laughs> but at any rate, the point is our critics believe that we just stand around pontificating, never admitting that there might be a Wolf Creek astrobleme to use that word that I don't know about. And so, um, after the break, I'll look that up. But we need to go back to the basics here. And that is the um, uh, junior high and high school earth science books that I've come in contact with in my uh, teaching as a, as, a high, as a high school biology, geology, earth science teacher back in the uh, 88, 89 school year. And then my further study has shown me that the uh, books don't present a multiple working hypothesis viewpoint. They don't say, oh, it may be an impact down there in Mexico. Oh, it may be a volcano. Or maybe it has nothing to do with that, but rather ties in to what we've spoken about in the past as catastrophic plate tectonics. Uh, so I yeah, think that's uh, an important point. Yeah, uh, sorry, I was just checking my uh, my notes to see where I, where I was. Um, one, I, I thought Tim Cleary's article was, was very very good. By the way, David, he uh, points out several anomalies. I, I won't quote all of them, but for for an impact site. Of, of that magnitude. He says the, the anomalies are the thinner than expected melt rich layers. He says that there's a lack of any substantial iridium anomaly. Alternative, yeah. explana ex alternative explanations for the high pressure and deformed minerals and the gravity anomaly. All, all, the, all these apparently are concerns uh, about the Chickalax loader and ultimately the asteroid extinction theory itself. An impact 
may have occurred, he says, at Chicolab during the flood, but if so, it seems to have been much smaller than commonly commonly claimed, yeah. creating a, a mere fraction of the postulated effects. And he goes on to say, and it's entirely possible there was never an impact in Chickaloob in the first place. All the data can easily be explained through non-impact explanations. Yes. And when you and I decided to give this presentation, I began to look through uh, the literature, the internet, and I expected to find um, clear-cut evidence there in the Yucatan Peninsula of this uh, iridium layer. Uh, and uh, you simply cannot find it in the way that the cartoon or um, uh, junior high earth science book uh, presents it. Standing for truth, may I go ahead and take my one hour break here? Standing for truth, is that okay for Absolutely. you? Go ahead and drop Absolutely, my video yeah. and I will go do my research on the Wolf Creek meteorite. Awesome. We'll see you soon, Professor McQueen. Well, that hour flew by and so much good information, uh, information, George, you and Professor McQueen are a blessing, a blessing on this topic. This is definitely, as, as we always say, and I'm going to say it here, this is one that I am going to rewatch and one that is very rewatchable, especially on this topic, right? Um, it's, it's an incredibly important topic that deserves this amount of focus, especially with the repeated talking points and claims from the critics, right, George? Uh, well, yeah, uh, SFT, look, look, um, you know, you live it, try, trying to condense 11 years of research into two hours is, is going to be a bit hard, but I'll, I'll, I'll just summarize some of the things like um, I, I – uh, also looked at uh, John McKay's um, creation research fact file, and uh, he, he's looked at uh, not not necessarily creationist um, articles and references, but he cites BBC, CNN, National Ge Geographic, Science, Science Daily, wh who who are also saying the same things. So it's not just the creationists that are saying that. Um, this impact was not a uh, impact site. They, they, they even have uh, skeptics, skeptics amongst themselves that can't, that aren't convinced uh, about about it through all the evidence that uh, they find. So I'm, I'm going to share. I'm going to share the screen again, uh, SFT. So because I've got a lot of other references, I want to quote a few things that they say from those references. So George. So, I'll do that now, and uh, hopefully you can put it up for me. I, I think uh, now that you've learned how to share a screen, I think you've got a, sh a share screen addiction now, George. Uh, so yeah, it's, well. It's, it's going to be tough to get you to stop screen sharing, I, I think, from, from here on out. Isn't that right? <laughs> well, that's that's right. I mean, I go, I, I go through uh, a, a lot of research, so I think uh, it's best to show them that I have yeah. these references, that I'm not just, you know, regurgitating them out of my rear end. Um, George. Yeah. George, since we have so many good shows now over the next, I mean, few weeks, I mean, we've got a show almost every other day. Did you want to um, announce the show we have with Sal on erosion real quick? And, and, and then I'll share your screen here. Yeah, no worries. Uh, one of the other powerful, um, pieces of evidence that actually confirms a young earth creation is the erosion. Now, Sal, Sal Giardino is a geologist and we've managed to get him to do a presentation for us on the 23rd of March. Uh, just keep an eye on the SFT channel and you'll get a, um, an indication of where it may be uh, airing in your part of the world. Uh, but it will be on the 23rd of um, March, uh, that is in America. So if you're in another place in the world, it might be in the first, first of April. But like, like I said, keep, keep an eye on the channel and you'll find exactly when that'll be aired. Uh, that's all I wanted to say, uh, regarding that, uh, SFT, but I'll go back to the, um, the topic in, of discussion. 
you'll, you'll see you'll see some ref, a reference there from Science Daily where they uh, reference the Palmer. Uh, we'll we'll talk about the Palmer a, a little bit. Um, this is what th they actually say. Blair Sh Shoney, a geologist at Princeton University, but he says the site does not definitively prove that that the impact ev event was the exclusive trigger of the mass extinction. Extinction. They say co it could be caused by large volcanic, large scale volcanic activity in what is now central India. So it goes back to those Dakar um, uh, volcanoes. Now, other geologists, as you can see, uh, say that they take a sense of suspicion about the Palmer himself, who, along with his PhD work, is also a curator at the Palm Beach Museum. They, they say his reputation suffered when, in 2015, he and his colleagues described the new genus of dinosaur named Dacataraptor, found in a site close to the Tarnas. Other later, others later pointed out that the reconstructed skeleton includes a bone that really belonged to a turtle, okay? So th this is why some people are skeptical about some of these other people saying this and that. Okay, so uh, you, you, can screen, you can screen capture some of these later on, by the way, and uh, search for them yourself. So same thing with the National Geographic. Um, they, they, they claim the geological interpretation seems very credible to me and the fish fossils do seem to record a catastrophic event at or near the asteroid impact. But, it says, the dinosaur aspect of the story isn't so clear to me. This is Stephen Brissett, a lecturer and researcher in paleontology at the University of Edinburgh. Remember I said to you, it's not just the geologists that are sceptical about it, but there are other scientists like paleontologists that also say the same thing. And here's another one. Paul Upchurch is a professor of paleontology at the University of uh, College London. He also has some reservations. He says, it is possible that the fish, etc., died for some other reason, something less spectacular and more local, and had little to do with the Chicklub impact. All right. There, for, for, for those people that don't know, this is what tectites uh, look like and I'd like David when he comes back to actually tell us how they actually dated these at 65.76 million years ago. I don't know much about him but I'm sure David might be able to expand there. Uh, there's, uh, there's some more there's some more re references there from Earth Pages from the Earth Pages uh, website. They say so there has been a long-running controversy over volcanic or extraterrestrial cause for extinctions, together with speculation that large impacts can somehow trigger continental base basalt events. The, the last does not work for the end Cretaceous extinction because the decan volcanism began somewhat before the formation of the smoking gun. I'll talk about the smoking gun at the end, okay? So there, there's the link to that uh, Earth Pages website. There, there, there's an interesting uh, German geologist by the name of Norbert Bruckert. He has done a ton of work on this. I, men I mentioned those, um, those, those core, the drill core test that, um, that he actually looked at. Uh, he says a lot, a lot to, he has a lot to say about it, okay? Uh, I'll, I'll actually, uh, when David comes back, I'll let him talk about some of the he's drill back. holes that he's back. Sorry, brother. he's back. Okay, I'm back. he's back. He's in the... Yeah, okay. I, I want to reiterate what we I said about uh, what Gutsy Gibbon said. There is not a single geologist, youth, young earth creation or conventional, that thinks the Chickaloop crater isn't from an asteroid. Not one. I've just shown you a number of them, including other scientists. That is that is true. <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, nope, not, not one, George, not one. Well, I, Dave, uh, Dave, David is a geologist himself. I'm sure. I'm sure he's skeptical about the impact. As oh well. yes, very true. I let me uh, report on my research on the Wolf Creek uh, meteorite impact. Um, that's a that's an impact area in Australia, George. As it turns out. Wolf Correct. Creek. 
I think and, I think it's either South Australia or Western Australia. I'm not sure. Yeah, I think it is Western Australia. And uh, I uh, did some quick research. Now, keep in mind, I found out the answer to this question uh, in uh, less than 10 minutes with some really remar remarkable references. So let me make some comments that are very important. Uh, I have not yet visited George in Australia. I hope to in the next couple of years. And maybe he and I will fly out uh, to Ayers Rock and uh, fly out to the Western Australia. But the best geologist is the one that's seen the most rocks. I haven't seen the Wolf Creek uh, meteorite impact, but from the images I uh, pulled up in the last 15 minutes, it looks like a legitimate meteorite impact. And I found a very interesting quote, one that, uh, George, I think you can add to your hundred other quotes. Listen to this. Australia's Wolf Creek crater is much younger than previously thought and has allowed scientists to calculate just how often meteorites hit the earth with the force of massive nuclear equation, uh, uh, explosions. Now, those of you that are students in our audience, when I read the Wolf Creek crater is much younger than previously thought, don't imagine that the geologist that wrote this paper is saying that, oh, ICR is right. AIG is right. McQueen is right. The earth is six to 10,000 years old. No, they're not going to say that. But the point is that as the uh, geologic community looks at uh, the actual data from Australia and Canada and Southern Africa, they're finding that things look a lot younger and a lot more robust than uh, previous thought. These are not events in antiquity, but rather uh, events that appear, as it says, much younger than previously thought. So to summarize, I think the answer is that the Wolf Creek meteorite meteor crater is a real crater. Now, a reference that I made earlier to uh, this word, Astrobleem is worth bringing up again. In my training as a young geologist in the 1970s, I worked around some senior men at the United States Geological Survey that had quite an interest in astrobleems. Now, an astrobleem, again, is a area, a geologic area, that appears to have received a meteorite impact. Uh, there are places in my home state of Tennessee, in the eastern part of the U.S., all over Canada, all over the world, that have been assumed for years to be meteorite impacts. Now, as a flood geologist, how do I sort through this? Well, my former boss, Bob Gentry, that I've spoken about, that was an expert in radioactive halos, as he would talk to me in the 1970s, he would say, McQueen, you have to understand that I've come to realize that the Great Flood was a solar system-wide catastrophe. And what he meant by that is that there was a tremendous amount of meteorite activity uh, during uh, the time of the Great Flood and the years, the centuries, rather, immediately after it. So, um a lot of these impact craters fit in quite nicely to uh, the period of the Great Flood. George, let me go back to you now. Yeah, David, while you're away, I actually showed a um, – I'll probably sh – I'll share my screen so you can actually see it yourself. Uh, just bear with me for a second. No problem. Uh, S SFT reckons I've become an expert at sharing screens now. There, there, that, that particular image there, David, um, these are tactites. It yes. clearly shows the size of them, but I actually wanted to know how they could actually date them at well, 65.76 million years. See, that's worth, that's worth commenting about. Uh, 
in your engineering life professionally, you have dealt with standard deviations of error and error bars throughout your career, whether it's the uh, uh, compressive stress of concrete or the tensile strength of uh, I-beams. I know you've dealt with this, right, George, throughout your career, right? No, de definitely. We did a yeah, whole year. So, yeah. And so when you see something 65.76, they're uh, putting forth the idea that radiometric dating is so accurate that we can go two decimal places or we can go two places to the right of the decimal. You know, this, from my experience in dealing with measuring even simple things like the, the pH of a uh, river here in Louisiana or the pH of ordinary salt water, um, it's hard to get it between, let's say, neutral would be pH of seven, between seven and eight, which would make it a bit more alkaline or six and seven, a bit more acidic. It's hard to even get it within that unit, much less saying uh, 7.65. Now, for those of you in the audience that deal with pH routinely, you can obviously buy a piece of equipment that will tell you pH to that second decimal. But my, my point is this, from previous discussions, I am an enormous critic about the assumptions of radiometric dating. And so to me, it's almost laughable that the evolutionary community would be able to say, oh, not only have we found these tectites in an area near the iridium uh, layer, near the top of the Cretaceous, but we can actually measure it to the second decimal place. Um, I am an enormous skeptic of that, George. Well, that's that's what uh, sort of alluded me to that image. I thought, how could they actually yeah, date something that accurately? But I, I mentioned this German professor, professor Norbert Brug, who's done a lot of work on the site, and he's looked at drill cores. And I'm going to show you some of those drill core cores now. And David, if you can help me out with um, with some of that. Yeah, no problem. I'm, now, let me go back to a previous chart to make sure everybody's on the same page. Oh, um, look I'll here. Stop. This is uh, this is the Caribbean, Gulf of Mexico. The circle is the object that we're talking about. And then if you draw a cross section through that, you will see, and there's my tree indicating it's a cross section, that a number of oil wells have been drilled offshore um, of the Yucatan Peninsula. Now, having said that, let's talk about the data you have, George, please. Okay, I'll go back to sharing the screen. Okay. So uh, let me go back to... Okay, th these are th these are the um, samples that he's looked at. So he's done a considerable amount of work. I, I believe um, Steph Harina, our own uh, Steph, has actually uh, been in touch with uh, Norbert Brug through email. And if, if you're if you're in if you're if anyone is interested, uh, you can actually email him email him himself uh, on that on that um, website. There he provides his email, so you can talk to him yourself. I've got no problems with it. But th those coloured um, the coloured map and the cross sections there are actual results of the core cause that uh, he accessed and he makes some interesting comments uh, about about him so david would you would you like to m uh, make some comments on those yeah I, did. Uh, I had three years of high school german and a year of college german i may contact this fellow and see if i can converse with him in german go ahead and give the screen back to me and let me make sure that the audience understands yep here is um uh, the candle I borrowed from Mrs. McQueen and notice that the diameter of it is less than a hand is less than a hand width. So that gives you an idea of that. This is just a few inches in diameter. 
the cores that were just shown are probably about this diameter. And so the way it works is as the um, oil well drills down into the surface, uh, here's a mortar and pestle that Ms. McQueen gave me for Christmas, and we can use that as an example. Imagine the pestle part here is the drill core drilling down. And so can you hear it grinding, grinding? It's rotating. Can you hear that standing for truth? Oh, I certainly did. Okay. So you can hear that grinding. That's grinding up rock, which is brought up by a barium-rich fluid to the surface. And an individual catches that rock and then takes it in and uh, begins an evaluation that ends up on a geologist's desk. And so all of this data is taken from uh, crushed up rocks that is brought to the surface. Uh, there have been places on earth where the oil companies have spent the money to get a real core, a real piece of rock, this diameter brought up from 10, 20, 30,000 feet. So it, it does happen that you can get the full rock, but most of the time you're dealing with crushed up uh, uh, pieces. Now, how does that tie in to those diagrams? The crushed up pieces can be sent to analysis and you can look for uh, the amount of carbonate, the amount of quartz. You might be able to even find impacted um, shocked quartz in it. Uh, and obviously you can look for elements uh, like um, you would find associated with crude oil. Um, uh, you can you can actually look for uh, products like benzene, ethyl benzene, xylene. Uh, you can do that kind of organic analysis, but you can also look for the iridium. And so let me go back to George and let him share with you the comments that this uh, European geologist made about whether you do or don't find this enormous iridium layer. George, take it from there. Well, th th these are the, some of the, George, some of the comments. Your screen again, oh, have you got, have are, you got are it you there? Your, are you wanting your screen to be shared again, George? Uh, yes, yes, please. Okay, you're all good, brother. Okay, th these, these are just some of the comments that uh, this geologist makes about the various, uh, various core holes and, and what he found in them. I'll, I'll let you re read them later on. I've just scrolled, so, so you, can, you can screenshot them and uh, read them at your own leisure. Okay. But, but uh, let me just go back and find... Uh, Okay, this is this is effectively what he says in this in this quote here. He says the the whole debate about the genesis of drill melt and breccias uh, at the Chickalabs crater is conducted with wrong assumptions. He says the Chickalabs impact crater is in fact the caldera, caldera, and you should know what a caldera is now because we've explained it. Right. Of a super, of a super volcano that is created by a huge gas explosion. He says the volcanic origin is by drilled pure andesite in the center of the structure, no doubt proved. He goes on to say the bedrock was blasted in a great extent and widely distributed. Okay, let me interpret some. Let me yeah. interpret. Leave that screen up there and let me okay. make sure that the audience knows what we're talking about. This uh, geologic word andesite is a type of igneous rock. And so what he's saying is very significant that when this uh, volcano erupted and he's obviously coming down the side of not an impact, but a volcanic origin, uh, it actually blasted up uh, rocks uh, from the, um, um, let's see how to explain this, uh, very deep rocks, uh, rocks that, I would initially interpret as rocks from the creation week, but I don't, I don't know that for sure, but at least you've got a, a type of volcanic rock. You see what uh, 
our colleague in Europe would have been looking for is if it blasted up sedimentary rocks rich in iridium. Okay, George. Okay, thank, thank you, David. Um, what I want uh, to show next is, uh, uh, okay, there, there's a excellent, excellent Ma Michael Lord article in, uh, I think you can, there's there's the ref, uh, actually that's, that's, I downloaded the PDF for, for that. He actually cites some 295 references for this article, right? He, he actually he actually says a four meter thick horizon with multiple iridium spikes is not what we were originally led to believe. The iridium spike in Italy, for example, at the KT boundary, was reported to be only one centimeter thick. This this goes to show that more observations can result in a different conclusion and this is what he this is what i find that's this is why i bothered this many times in geology it is the unreported data which is the most crucial to a proper interpretation that's a very uh, good point uh, yeah last week i called mike ord to talk about a research project that we're planning in 2022 i guess to look at uh, a spillover area uh, not far from Las Vegas. And he and I were talking about a number of things. And this type of observation that he made about what data is left on a table is critically important to the Standing for Truth audience. And the reason is this. Um, you look at evidence that the moon is actually made of cheese. And so you put all the data that you have that the astronauts ate cheese on the moon on one side of the table. And then someone else says, no, no, no. The, uh, the moon is a group of volcanic rocks. So you put that on the other side of the table. And so using the concept of multiple working hypothesis, the idea that the moon is made of cheese is cartoon-like, so you immediately dismiss that, just as you should admit, just as you should dismiss the junior high level uh, cartoons about this meteorite impact changing the climate and cha changing the chemistry to cause the extinction of the dinosaurs. And so what you leave on the table and don't talk about, that's an important point, isn't it, George? Oh, well, very, very true. Yeah, that's why I actually put, put it there in bold. But another comment that uh, Gutsy Gibbon left was regarding the iridium. You'll, you'll notice there, she says, iridium boundary is rough, is rough for young earth creationism. Volcanism can't account for the concentration. You'll note just above that, the volcano at Kilawa, I, th I hope I'm pronouncing that right, in, in um, Hawaii, yeah. You'll see that ball. It, said, it says strikingly large concentrations of iridium were also observed. The ratio of iridium to aluminium being 17,000 times its value in Hawaiian basalt. So yeah. that destroys, I don't know where she got that from. I, I, I really can't, but there, yeah, there's, there, there's, the, there's an article there from Geology Review that looks at not only the Kilauea volcano, but also other volcanoes <clears throat> to support that. Um, yeah, and your point's yeah. well taken. Uh, I did field work at the Kilauea volcano back in 1985. And so I've, I've been in the area. I've seen the dome. I didn't actually see an eruption, fortunately. But the issue of uh, the amount of this element that has captured the attention the iridium uh, is uh, an important point, an important point to emphasize over and over again that it's not just unique to meteorites. After we take a couple of questions from the audience standing for truth, I want to uh, go back to a story about the um, chondritic meteorite that landed not far from my house, but let's... Uh, 
George, why don't we take a couple of questions from the audience here? What do you have on your desk standing for truth? Can, David, before, so before we do that, good, oh, go ahead, before George. we do that, can I, can I just make what, one uh, comment? Or I'd like to share the screen just to finish this part about iridium. Yes, please. <laughs> I told you, and then, George, then we'll you're go addicted, to you're addicted. Uh, <laughs> I will share this screen now. Here we go. Okay. You're so good, you, brother. You'll, you'll, notice, you'll notice new scientists there. It says dinosaur extinction lines up closely with timing of volcanic eruptions. And they cite the Deccan traps in Western India. Do, doesn't all this sound a bit like a massive upheaval of, of Earth's geology like you'd find in what we always predicted about a global flood tectonic plate movements right. massive volcanic eruptions and and the work mass extinctions it all fits in with the biblical narrative yes and i would recommend That's to the standing for truth audience that they go back and reread genesis 6 7 and 8 and you'll see it talks about the breakup of the fountains of the great deep and the windows of heaven opening well, let's focus on the breakup of the fountains of the great deep. That sounds like volcanic eruptions to me, huh, George? Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, just, just um, I've got other, sorry, uh, Stanley, I've got other references just to, just to show you that we're not being biased here. Yeah, take your time. Take I've, your, I've read, hey, I've read hey, references. George, leave, no stone leave no stone unturned. That's fine, yeah. brother. No, but we, we can get to these other references after we take some questions, but I just wanted okay. to make the point that we looked we looked at um, articles, and I'll show you those later, where they specifically say that that the dinosaurs were definitely killed by an asteroid, asteroid, not volcano. So we looked at all the research here. We weren't very biased and went only to what ICR or IOG or CMI have said. So we've looked at and and we've looked at independent geologists and scientists of other other areas that have this skepticism about this impact theory. It, it just doesn't make sense. And I okay. will make a comment there about uh, what Logical said about whether Erica has shown up yet. And that's, a, that's an important point. I have been arguing the creation evolution issue since I was in high school in the late 1960s. And I, wel I welcome critics like Erica that uh, present a viewpoint that we could discuss because I think that we're in what I would like to call a marketplace of ideas. So right. standing for truth, how do you like the idea of we walk into a certain part of Canada and we want to buy a number of those fine hats that keep you warm? And so we're in this marketplace of ideas and some of the hats have fur on them. Some of them have no fur at all. And so we welcome our critics because it helps us refine our argument. And if you come back to this video and very carefully look at the references that uh, George has put on the screen, I think you'll clearly see that both evolutionary geologists and also a half a dozen of creation geologists uh, question the meteorite impact uh, reference to this part of the Yucatan Peninsula. Uh, that's, the a other thing, point, that's a great point, uh, the Professor McQueen. Yeah, the, George, yeah, the, uh, yeah, yeah, make I your point, gonna, brother, and, and then we'll go to the next question. Go ahead. Yeah, take your time, George. Go ahead. I was just going to add to to Andrew P's question there. We've said numerous times on this channel that we are encouraging critical thought. We want to hear all the different arguments. Right. We want to hear the secular arguments. How else are you going to make a decision if you don't know your opponent's um, line of thinking? You know, you, you need to do and that. So we, we'll accept any any theory, hypothesis, and look at it. And it's why we do these lengthy streams focusing on one topic at a time, right? Yeah, and yeah. we allow live 
audience questions, objections. You know, we want to be as thorough as possible. We advocate advocate for uh, critical thinking. We host debates, discussions. So this is important. So here's the thing. These critics yeah. can resort to ad hominems and scoff. But if they're not actually willing to at least have cordial dialogue and discussion on the evidence, yeah. focus on the evidence, right? Not on yeah. the, uh, on the person. See, so, yes. This question from Andrew here, uh, what do you think about Ord's model where the flood started by meteorite impacts? Uh, Michael Ord and I were supposed to, the 1st of April, just 30 days from now, we were supposed to meet for several days in Vegas, taking our wives on a vacation there. And then he and I were going to go down to the Mojave River to look at an issue of uh, spillover, uh, a spillover model for the erosion of that, some canyons on the eastern end of the Mojave River. Uh, Ord and I disagree about the origin of that. And so here are uh, two creation, two creationists. They're going to spend several days walking in the Mojave Desert, uh, talking about the data. Um, and so it's no surprise that Michael Ord does not agree with every aspect of my flood model that I've given on previous episodes of Standing for Truth. And it should not be surprising that I don't agree with everything Michael Ord says. But where's the lesson in this? Where's the science education lesson in this? If creation scientists are real scientists playing by the rules of debate and logical inquiry, is there any surprise that we would disagree among ourselves? Um, obviously, there's a disagreement between deep time people that believe the earth is over 4 billion years old and somebody like me that believe the evidence points to thousands, not billions, but can you see standing for truth that there's internal debate, which shows that we've got some real science going on, on the creationism side of things. Amen. Amen. Well said, Professor McQueen. Um, this question came in earlier when, um, we were discussing a little bit about the uh, continental breakup during the flood, fountains of the Great Deep breaking open, uh, rapid movements of, of the plates, right? Continental sprint. Uh, Graham, thanks so much for your question. We appreciate your, um, your input and your support. He says, I'd like Professor McQueen to comment on the idea of the continents dividing after the flood. Okay. Um, his comment is one that has been discussed for um, a long time. Uh, there's a passage in the book of Genesis that talk about the uh, a, a individual called Peleg, and there's a, a comment about division. And some geologists years ago used to think that that would refer to a breakup of the continents after the flood had completed. And so... Uh, let me go ahead and draw a picture here uh, that you've seen me draw before. Uh, I'll put a north arrow on here to indicate this is a map view. And then here is the one world continent that ended up being in the creation week. Uh, so let me move it over here. So there's the one world continent. Those of you that have had Geology 101, will recognize Gondwana land and the Tetha Sea and all the vocabulary. But it's a C-shaped uh, uh, continent. Uh, I think it stands for creation in English, but that's just my English bias there. At any rate, one, one way or the other, it's, it's a C. And so the idea of catastrophic plate tectonics is the idea, and I will draw at random here. Well, not random, but. I'll try to illustrate some pieces here. Uh, and I'll put uh, North America here. And uh, why don't we put uh, Australia there and then Europe here with an E. Let me put the top on this marker before I spill it all over 
my white shirt. Okay, here we go. Now look at this. So the idea of catastrophic plate tectonics is during the time of the flood, the area of North America that you see right here uh, began to break along the Mid-Atlantic Mid Ridge. Europe began to form in the area where I've got an E. And Australia is down there uh, uh, associated with what is now Southern Africa. And it broke away and began to move, move away. And so here you've got this one world continent that breaks into pieces. The idea of catastrophic plate tectonics is that these pieces of the one world continent moved apart for a few weeks, collided again, moved apart, collided again. And so we have the formation of the Appalachian Mountains uh, very early on in the, this tectonic event. Uh, exactly where the mountains in Morocco fit in and exactly where the Himalayas or Himalayas fit in is a topic for much study. But the point is this, the issue of uh, continental separation, we now believe happened during the time of the flood and not as, is, is not related to this reference to Peleg, which you can look up in the book of Genesis as something that happened after the flood. Now, that's not to say there might have been minor separations. Like if you look, uh, for example, at the continent of Africa and the Saudi subcontinent, uh, you know, maybe that opening there might have occurred in the time after the flood, what might be called a time of residual catastrophism. I hope that answers the question. George, you have a comment on that? Uh, no, be, um, because I've got a lot of other material that I want to present before we uh, shut down. Okay, but go the, ahead, the, 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 the next part, David, you, you'll find somewhat amusing, okay? But I'll, I'll leave it to you whether you think it's amusing when I share it. Go so, right ahead. Standing, if you're there, could you please share my screen? Hey, that's what I'm here for, George. Here we go. Yeah, otherwise, we're going to sack you. <laughs> yeah. No, we're not going to sack him. <laughs> yeah, he, he, here's, an, here's an article which uh, says dinosaurs were definitely killed by asteroids and not volcano, new study says. Yeah, you'll find it says Dr. Alessandro Chiarenza from the Imperial College London said in a statement, in contrast, the effects of the intense volcanic eruptions were not strong enough to substantially disrupt global e e ecosystems. Uh, now, the, fo the following couple of references you might find amusing. Here's another theory. A lack of oxygen is blamed for dinosaur extinction. It, it says, a new analysis of air trapped in 120 million year old fossils, researchers said cast doubt on the notion that dinosaurs became extinct after an object hit the planet 65 million years ago, sending up dust that blocked the sun and killed the plant life. Now, okay, now slow down, George. That's, yeah. that's worth coming about there. Okay. Uh, so we've been, we've been criticized for finding soft tissue in dinosaurs, and now they're claiming that we can find gas trapped in the lungs and bowels of these dinosaurs, and somehow we can analyze that gas. Uh, so we've got not only dinosaur soft tissue, but we have uh, trapped atmospheric ga gas, maybe in fossils. Another day, we'll have a session talking about a mineralogical phenomenon called fluid inclusions that allows us to understand the chemistry of what the flood water might be in. Go on, George. Very interesting. That that's how their story goes. I'm going to share that screen again, uh, standing, so get ready. Okay. Uh, I, I have to admit, I, I didn't know what phlebotonum meant, but reading the article, it's quite funny. It says that at the time traveling big game hunters killed the dinosaurs. I just put that in there for a bit of a laugh. It says one yeah, finds yeah. out that the, 
That's a bit the of a laugh. The cannabis family, which also includes marijuana, were important ground cover plants. In the, you think they're trying to say that they uh, they ate too much of the uh, happy weed and uh, they become extinct or what? Next There's time, the next time they'll be telling us they were wearing bell bottoms and dancing yeah. to the Beatles. Yeah. Now, that is, is, there's also a hybrid theory, okay? Uh, um, one says, a contributing factor, but not the only culprit in the dinosaur extinction, meaning a number of different things could have been the uh, source of uh, the extinction. Well, well, we say it was a global flood that caused it all. Another, yeah. another one says, what killed the dinosaurs? Uh, I'll leave it there just so you can take a screenshot if you want to read read it later. There are 10 theories what killed the dinosaurs. Apparently, I, I read somewhere, actually, there's something up to about 100 theories about what killed the dinosaurs. Now, this is another one. Microbes may have caused Earth's biggest extinctions. They say the findings suggest that bacteria, with a little help from a massive volcano, produce large quantities of methane killing thereby killing 90% of the life on the planet. And another CBS article, which pretty much says the same thing. Uh, you got to laugh at this. Did farting kill the dinosaurs? Prehistoric beasts may have tooted so much methane into the air that they triggered a catastrophic climate change. You know, oh, sorry, I'm, this, I'm laughing so bad here. <laughs> yeah, this is, this is so laughable and... We need to return momentarily to the reality of this. See, if the biblical model is true, then two of every kind of every animal that breathed air was on board the ark. And so that means that as the beasts went off the ark and the dinosaurs went off the ark, the descendants of Shem, Ham, and Japheth chose not to live in swampy areas around alligators because their children could be eaten by these things. Uh, and I think by the same token, mankind basically separated themselves from uh, dinosaurs in the centuries after the flood. But, but I would challenge our critics to explain to me why in every culture, on every continent, there is a dragon legend. Uh, the city in the former Soviet Union called Georgia, uh, that area of Georgia, uh, is named for St. George, the brave knight that killed a dragon while saving a damsel in distress. The Soviets got a lot of things wrong, but they got the geography wrong. Turns out that particular event occurred in North Africa, I understand. But at any rate, the point is, how do we explain a pervasive historical account uh, that includes mankind up until the Middle Ages uh, slaying dinosaurs? Uh, what have you thought about that argument, George, over the years? Uh there's lots of so many lots of theories out there. I, I just I just laugh at a lot of them, but the, the one that makes sense to me is the is the flood model. It, it, expl it explains most of the um, uh, evidence that we find. But uh, I've, I just just because we're sort of uh, going to um, one and three quarter hours, David, I just want to finish off some of these things so we can wrap up. Yes, please do. Yeah, one of the other the other ones is the erosion of the ozone layer. Uh, again, there's there's a rec there's a reference there you can read for yourself later on. Uh, this this is the email that I mentioned earlier from that geologist uh, Norbert Brug from Germany. So if you want to contact him and go into a discussion about it, feel free. Uh, like I said, uh, a few people have have done so, but there's another article yeah, by Sam. I'm going to, I'm going to write his uh, email down now while you're talking. Go ahead. I, I will I'll send it to you, Dave, if you like, because I've got to have to okay, scroll good. down, okay? Okay, good. So, so, so an article by Sam Wong says, uh, t uh, two new studies on the timing of volcano events help us piece together the story of Earth's most famous mass extinction, but they leave it unclear exactly what triggered 
the demise of so many species. Hello, we, we, can, we can tell you that it was the global flood. So I just, I'm just going to scroll through these because we don't have a lot of time. Um, yes. Yeah. Conclu conclusions based on 30 years of research. Uh, there's, there's a link to that uh, article there. You can, you can read it for yourself. Uh, yeah, this, I'll just scroll slowly so you can screenshot them later on. Uh, here we go. There, there's a Professor Goethe Keller of Princeton and Professor Wolfgang Stinnersberg of the University of Karlsruhe. Uh, back to differ in terms of the um, impact theory. And they actually say the Chickalek's impact, they said, was too old to have finished off the dinosaurs, then there must have been another impact somewhere else, which was to blame. The crater has not yet been found. There's some more references of people. Uh, Claire Belcher of the Royal Hol uh, Holloway University of London has found evidence which suggests that wildfires were not widespread in North America following the KT impact. Professor Dave Archibald of San Diego State University says he's convinced that the survival of creatures such as frogs disproves the idea that dinosaurs perished amid acid rain as strong as battery acid or that an impact winter caused the massive and sustained drop in temperature. For those that, that aren't aware, uh, frogs are very sensitive to water quality uh, changes. Uh, a small uh, small change in the water quality can kill off the frogs. A massive volc uh, a massive um, um, forget uh, a massive impact would have created a lot of acid rain and and really made a, a mess of uh, their, their actual ecosystem. Dr. Norman McLeod of the Natural History Museum in London uh, says, scientists who are convinced that dinosaurs were already being driven to extinction by climate change long before the arrival of KT impact or impacts. So, so they're, they're skeptics about this impact theory. <laughs> so do the data support a large meteor impact at Chickalux? There's that article by Timothy Cleary. Very good article, by the way. I haven't yeah. got time to go through the, um, all the points that he's made, but there's there's an actual uh, podcast uh, that I uh, was I actually deleted because of copyright issues. But if you go to that, where's that uh, reference? That reference there in Answers in Genesis, you can listen to the podcast, and he lays down numerous pieces of evidence why an impact could not have been the reason for the mass extinctions. And so, so uh, consensus science cannot just justify the impact uh, I've highlighted there. Uh, a high pressure shock metaphorms, meta, metamorphism conditions and altered minerals can be caused by other circumstances, including rapid crystallization and volcanic activity, as David mentioned earlier. So the questions are, uh, still remain, is the timing of the impact, the thinner than expected melt rich layer, the, the lack of any substantial iridium due to the impact, the less than expected high pressure minerals, the lack of pseudo tectolite present in the cores, the relative undisturbed Cretaceous sediments beneath the melt rich lenses and the ambiguous nature of the gravity anomaly all raise concerns about the Chickalub crater and ultimately the asteroid extinction theory. He, uh, Tim says the burden of proof has still not been met. And uh, D David mentioned uh, 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 a verse of, uh, from Genesis. Here, we, we, we're going to say to you, in the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, the 17th day of the month, the same day where all the fountains of the great deep broke open and the windows of heaven were opened. Guys, this is a better explanation to all the evidence we've just shown you. <clears throat> so because the Bible is also a historical book, we should look for signs for those fountains of the great deep. And obviously there is evidence that the Chickalab crater has formed after a massive 
supervolcano eruption. All right, so standing, I know you, I know you want to wrap uh, wrap this up, but uh, I'll just scroll through and just get to my final statement. Uh, there's there's lots there. Sorry if I'm going too far. You're welcome, there's, Melissa. There, there, there's that Michael J. Ord, 295 references he provides to this article that he's written. <clears throat> there's also the dialogue with a great German geologist, that uh, uh, Brug fellow that I mentioned earlier, you can look at. Conclusion. It seems so far geologists and other scientists just can't make up their minds. Was it an asteroid, volcanoes, dinosaur farts, rapid acidification of the oceans, climate change, etc., etc., etc. The stories just keep coming. <laughs> One day someone will probably suggest all of the above or maybe it was catastrophic. Go, woo, woo ha, shock, hera. And this is my final statement to you, Erica. So we can now see that after careful examination of the data, the smoking gun appears to be mostly smoke. Erica fails again. So what is what was that you said about me being an anti-geologist, Erica? So I'll, I'll, I'll stop sharing there and I'll, I'll leave the comment, the closing comments to you, Stanley, and to David. Well, I, I want to make a comment about the Chickaluba area. Um, I hope this will motivate people to travel to the Yucatan, to travel to these archaeological sites that are uh, on the uh, Yucatan Peninsula and do your own research. See, some of you are not retired. Some of you are 30 and 40-year-old uh, young scientists that once COVID clears by Christmas probably, uh, you can freely visit the Yucatan and other parts of Mexico, and we would encourage you to do additional research. There's no accident that uh, our colleagues have named this effort Standing for Truth. So there's no fear of truth providing a problem in understanding uh, the Bible. As George correctly pointed out, uh, one conclusion of all the different episodes of Standing for Truth is that um, the Bible is a historical uh, document and can be trusted. And there you can see we're scrolling through previous discussions we've had that may be of interest to you. Amen. Very other, well said, other... Professor McQueen. Um, real quick, George. Uh, we've got a lot of new visitors in the chat, a lot of new subscribers. I think we're going to um, hit 4,000 subscribers probably with it, within the month, hopefully. So I want to let people know, especially because we've got roughly 1,200 videos on our channel on every topic you can think of. So I've organized yep. them into a huge number of playlists. Specifically, we've got a playlist here with Professor David McQueen, all of his appearances on this channel. And uh, this playlist has thousands and thousands of views answering nearly every every question you can think of on, on this topic, especially uh, pertaining to the global flood. So please, uh, please check those out. Uh, Professor McQueen, it seems so long ago now that we had you on for economic geology, uh, yes. basin modeling. You know, that was our first. Yeah, that was our first one. But uh, before I ask uh, you guys um, permission to leave the studio, I want to make a, a parting a comment, and that's this. We, we recognize that hundreds of people are coming into Standing for Truth uh, in the month of February, in the month of March, and will come in in the month of April. So never worry about repeating a question. For example, I see some questions uh, earlier about dendrochronology and uh, the idea of coral uh, rings and so forth. These are things that we can pick up and take uh, take apart, if you will, in the months ahead. But uh, I want to compliment my colleague George for the fine amount of research that he did. And I will go ahead standing for truth and bid you guys good night because I think we're coming to the two hours, aren't we? 
Yes. God bless you, David. Thank, thank you for joining the stream. God bless you, Professor McQueen. Yes, we did not actually we just, and go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh no, I was just going to say yes. We just hit the two hour mark, and uh, both of you gentlemen put a lot of work into this uh, specific program, uh, as you do with every program. So I want to thank you both for that. God bless you, gentlemen, you brothers in Christ. So uh, the chat has had a great time. We've had roughly over thirty almost the entire time. So God bless you, Professor McQueen. Uh, and I'm looking have a good forward. Night. I'm looking forward later on in the month to the debate that you've helped me set up, and I'll I'll be uh, uh, very uh, interested in that debate format because I think the audience can uh, learn a lot uh, from a debate format. Good night, gentlemen. Amen. No worries, Good night, David. Professor McQueen. Good night, Professor McQueen. So as as you guys heard it there, we we've got it um, advertised. We've got Professor David McQueen. We've got him and Jordan from Reasons to Doubt. Uh, he is an engineer and his expertise is in, uh, I believe, nuclear engineering, uh, you know, uh, dating methods, topics specific to, um, to that. So we've got Jordan and Professor McQueen debating uh, whether or not there is evidence for accelerated nuclear decay. So that's going to be kind of informal. We're going to have opening statements, but it's going to be a cordial, respectful and professional dialogue between uh, Professor McQueen and Jordan. I am going to moderate it and it's going to be a lot of fun. It's going to be at the end of the month. And then at the beginning of next month, we've got Joseph Hubbard, who's going to be debating as well. Um, I'll, I'll probably, I just got to confirm an exact time and then I'll, I'll let you know who his interlocutor is. And um, I will post it in the upcoming live streams, guys. We got so many debates, discussions, interviews. So try and uh, keep yourselves up to date by looking at the uh, live stream upcoming live streams. You'll see uh, most of those in there. I think we've got about eight or so in there currently. So uh, brother George, great job tonight. Any final words, my man? Actually, before I do, Mitchell, thanks so much for your super chat. Guys, thanks so much for your super chats and your support today. Um, we've got a lot planned, a lot of projects planned for the future. So, uh, you know, God bless everybody for your support. Um, we always have in the description boxes where you can sign up for Patreon where we are putting out uh, exclusive material just for our Patreons. We've got a video that Raw Matt's been working on for about a week. It's going to be a great video touching on a number of important Young Earth creation related topics that will be released exclusive for our uh, faithful Patreon. So check that out. And if you want to consider supporting us, we are uh, working towards a Standing for Truth creation conference, hopefully by summer. Uh, so we want to get you guys a lot of great speakers, make it about a three-day event. So that's going to consist of a lot of work, energy, uh, of course. So if you want to help us reach that goal, then consider supporting us. So uh, and, and even by support, I mean just sharing our material, hitting that like button, hitting that subscribe button. So God bless you all. This has been another great stream. I'm going to hand it over to George. George, this was amazing. <laughs> I'm going to rewatch this probably tonight. Uh, this was another forced retirement, forced early retirement for Guts and Given, uh, Brother George. So you did a fantastic job. Uh, go ahead. The floor is yours uh, to wrap us up. Go ahead, brother. Uh, uh, th thank you very much. Uh, look, I, I don't know where they get these notions and these comments that they put uh, on the screens about uh, impact craters about me being an uh, an anti geologist, uh, geologist and whatever. It look it really doesn't bother me. It's like water off a duck's back, to be honest. But uh, one thing I'd like to say, standing is anyone in the chat who wants, I, I know it's hard to screenshot and then retype those um, links to web addresses. If you let me know in the comment section. I will make those available for you so you can just click the reference and you can read the articles yourself. But uh, I had a really good joke uh, all set up for um, Professor McQueen because he likes lawyer jokes. Did you know that? <laughs> so, <laughs> so, I've got, joke? so I've I've got one for him, okay? Maybe he'll um, listen to the program again and uh, – 
and probably hear this. So a lawyer, a priest and a schoolboy were sitting side by side on a plane. Suddenly they watched as one by one the engine stopped working as the ash from the volcano they flew over clogged them. So that's a volcano joke, right? The pilot announced sadly, there's not, <clears throat> there's not a damn thing we can do, he says. We're going to crash. Thank you for flying with us. Very nice of him. <laughs> while, while everyone was panicking, the three went to the back of the plane and found two parachutes. The lawyer said, I'm the best educated man in the world, so I should have a parachute. He took the first parachute and jumped. The priest looked over at the boy and reflected on his life. He said, kid, you take the last parachute. With any luck, I'll see our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ, soon. The kid said, no, no, no. He said, you take the second parachute. He says, the best educated man in the world just jumped out with my school bag. <laughs> 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 okay that's okay you can wrap it up now that's a good way to end it because as we always say brother laughter is the best medicine it's why we pay you the big box it's why that award <laughs> that award george should be uh in the mail anytime because you are my award-winning co-host <laughs> and and once again a, a stream to remember uh brother bob in the chat says just give the links to standing and he can put them in the description so if you want send me those links george we'll add them to the description box everybody please share this video on facebook uh share with your friends your families uh you know get this information out uh this is the truth and we want uh this to get out to as many people as possible that's why we make sure that these programs these interviews discussions are comprehensive you know we oftentimes go over two hours and we've got a lot more to come for example michael j ord who we spoke of today a uh, brilliant flood researcher. He's going to be on again first thing in April. This time he's going to give a presentation on the Ice Age. And then we'll uh, follow that up with a question and answer, guys. So uh, here we go. I mean, March is already flying by. So uh, I'm already booking lots of shows and interviews for, um, for April. So anyways, God bless everybody. And uh, we'll see you tomorrow night, Fighting Back versus Boy on Hyperionism versus Christianity. So, George, what God, do we say God, before we close her down? God bless you all. And um, from SFT, we are out. <laughs> God bless.